Okay, you can put your homework aside and pull out your note packet if it's not out yet. Let's compare and make sure we all have the right logic here.
and they all are called crystals, actually, um, because of this idea. Okay? So what's cool about this as we get into the property side of things is that all of the properties of ionics can be explained by its structure. As I said, and we'll keep saying before, structure determines function. So the reason why ionics have the properties they do has something to do with this idea of these being held together, which is all about a columbic force. So thinking back, can anyone by raising hand remind us what a columbic force means or how we've talked about it before? Do you remember from columbic? We talked about back with trends. Yeah, oh, there's the whole artificial polar electron collision. Close, it's just about the force. So columbic is purely the force of a positive and negative thing, which in our case before was the nucleus to the electrons. So what were the two factors that influenced this positive and negative force? Oh, I see. Say that again. A network. Then remember what were the two factors that influence if it's a strong force or a weak force? Austin, what's one of them? Uh, distance. distance, right? So the farther away they are, the less the attraction. How is my face for that? In terms of an ionic, that refers to the size of them. If this gets bigger, that, de that increases distance because now they just can't get as close to each other. Okay, so now they aren't physically moving away, but the size of them influences distance. Mason, did you have the other one? Sorry, McKay, did you have the other one for us? I just said magnitude. Magnitude, good, which refers to, this sometimes could be a plus two charge or a minus three charge. Those are gonna have more strength than a plus one minus one. So that's in our case what magnitude refers to is the actual charge of it. Is it a plus one ion or a plus two ion? So on and so forth. Have some ideas about McKay. So with that being said, I want you to think about this question. Um, First step is no talking, just think on your own, and then I'll let you compare with your neighbor. Okay, so the question says here, <coughs> which ionic compound would you predict would have the strongest interaction or the strongest bond energy? So are these two gonna hold tighter or are these two gonna hold tighter? Don't talk to your neighbor, just circle one on your paper and tell me why. Okay, and I'll give you Don't talk to your neighbor though. I want it, your brain to think and work. I'll let you a chance to compare in a second. That's why it's called a think pair share. First step though is you just gotta think. So circle one of the answers and then tell me why. Which one is gonna have a stronger interaction? Good, I should see something circled and then also a why. down when you come to an answer. With your table, so here's our pair. We're going to pair up as a table. Look at your element that you are. Everybody look at your element. Whoever at your table has the least amount of protons, I want you to share your answer with everybody else. So look at the look at your little parts. Whoever has the lowest atomic number between the two <laughs> Share your answer to this question. Okay? All right, ready, set, go. Okay. Uh, I put the second one.
misinterpretation of it. So when things don't melt on the hot plate, it's just because their melting point is too high and the hot plate won't ever get there. So it just isn't hot enough for it. So we just say it's a high melting point. Does that make sense? Yeah. Who's our yellow table? Oh, you remember why you said low oh, no, melting? I think it was because we saw like melt slower or something. So my guess is maybe you just looked at the wrong one. Because ionics should, they'll never melt on our hot plates. They have melting points of like 900, 1,000 degrees. And our hot plates don't need that hot. So they can melt, but it's going to take a lot of heat. So. Okay, questions on our ionics? Okay, let's go to, we're going to film that other side later, the molecular view of the table. So just skip that column. Um, we'll come back to that later. Okay, let's go to covalence and understand what goes on with them. So a covalent bond happens through a shared relationship because both atoms are holding tight to their electrons. And so rather than giving them up, like in ionic, they just share. Now the way the sharing works is chlorine has seven valence, right? There's seven around it, okay? It often actually bonds, okay, with hydrogen. Hydrogen has one. The share happens in this overlap region here. Okay, so this was hydrogens, this one was chlorines, but they share an overlap, and now they belong to both. And so now chlorine has a full shell, hydrogen has its full shell, because it only needs two for the first shell, remember, um, and now they're both stable. So when the sharing happens, the ones they put in the middle now belong to both. It's like they're children, right? They belong to both of them now, okay? Now, with covalence, the structures of covalence get way more 
diverse because there's a lot of ways that sharing can happen. In this case, it's a one-to-one -one share, but often it gets, I'm gonna share one on this side, oh, but now I'm gonna share one on that side, then you can share again, and so these molecules can get bigger because of all the different sharing that's going on. So there's not as simple of a picture as ionic, so ionics always look like this. Okay, so when you think ionic, visualize this network of positive and negative. But covalent, it's kind of hard to have one set picture because there's so many options it can be. Our whole next unit will be all about covalent, so we'll understand that better. For now, the biggest thing is recognizing covalent is shear um, between the two. Um, here's another one, like our dopamine up here. This is a covalent molecule. All of those little gray bars represent them being shared between them. But you can imagine if you took this apart, how many different things you could build with these Lego pieces. And that's how many different covalents exist in the world. Okay? Um, questions on a covalent? Okay, let's go to our properties. Um, covalents, yes, are sometimes malleable. And the reason, part of that why it's sometimes is because of all the different ways those molecules can be built. And so sometimes they can shift, other times they can't. Um, very good. Let's come back to melting because we got some more difference there. Um, solubility. Same thing, covalents are sometimes soluble. Yep, that is a true conclusion. Um, same reason, because their structures can vary so much. Sometimes they dissolve, sometimes they don't. And then on our back one, though, they do never conduct as solids. Um, that never happens. So that one is a great conclusion. Coming to our melting point here, the main conclusion is the right one. So most of us on the right track, they do typically have very low melting points. Um, and everything you'll test in this class will melt fairly easily. I will say there are a few exceptions, but they're very rare exceptions um, of them actually being very, very high. A great example is diamond is a covalent bond, um, but obviously diamond doesn't melt easily. Um, but for everything we're testing, we're gonna say that covalents are always low. Okay, um, blue team or orange team, do you happen to remember why you came to that conclusion so we make sure we're not deceived when we do our unknown testing? Maybe you already figured out what these were. The tricky thing, melting's a great test, but it can be deceiving, number one, um, and sometimes if something is melting or melts so quick it then starts to burn, you may miss that it's actually just, like it melted, and you'd be like, oh, it's burning, and so then you kind of label it differently, so something to be cautious with, okay? All right, questions on covalent properties. Between the two, right away with our test, we figured out which one do you think is harder to determine its identity, an ionic or a covalent? Why would you say covalent, Peter? Because there's a lot of sometimes, and so there's not as definitive, like, if it does this, I know it must be this substance. So in your test that you'll do, that's going to be the hardest one to figure out, is the covalent side of things. It can still be figured out, but it takes the most data. Okay? All right, let's go to metallic bonding. So metallic bonding is only metals, right? Metals with metals. What happens in a metallic bond is so each of these blue dots represent an atom. Okay, let's call it gold, okay? The atoms, because they're metals, all give up their electrons very easily. The problem is they don't have very many to begin with. So they're trying to get a full shell, but like if we're all gold in here, we all only come with one. And so it's like, okay, how do we make this work so we can have a full shell when we only have one to give? So it's like covalent in that it's sharing, but it's not a one-to-one -one share. In covalent, it's like, I'm gonna share one with you, you share one with me, we create that bond. In metallic, there's not enough to go around, so everybody shares with everybody. They sometimes call it the C of electrons. So these are their electrons to start with. They let go of them, and then they just start moving around like crazy, and so it feels like everybody has enough. When in the end, if you paused it, they really don't have eight. But because it never stops moving, it's as if it's everywhere. I think of it like a spinning fan idea, right? Like while a fan is stopped, it might only have three blades. But while it's spinning, it looks like it's everywhere. And that's kind of the idea with the metallic bond. Is the sea of electrons go everywhere, 
and so it feels like they have a full shell. Okay. Um, questions on this idea of the electron C, as it's sometimes nicknamed. Once again, it's like covalent because they are sharing, but a little bit different. Okay. Um, so here's once again the process that happens. The electrons are released, so they are giving up their valence. <coughs> okay. Um, once again, because they're metals and they don't really hold on to them tightly to begin with. Okay, then the cations and electrons see is formed, and then similar to ionics, positive and negatives attract. And so then it's held together because you have this negative C holding together all these positive atoms. Okay, um, so it's held together by that positive and negative attraction force again. Questions on like visualize once again. You want to be able to visualize like what a metallic bond looks like, right? From a model. Like if you were given a model, can you tell me, oh, that's a metallic bond or that's a covalent bond? Okay? Questions on that? Okay, let's go to our test. Um, so metals, yes, are always malleable. Oh yes, yeah. I'm a little confused on the notes because I think the terms just a little bit there. Okay. So I'm not used to Oh, did you figure it out? No worries, no worries. Okay, so metallics are always valuable. Um, you can always shape metals and they don't shatter. Now, Cameron was talking to me about this, so others may have thought of it too. Some metals take a lot of force to be malleable, right? Like you can't easily shape them, but in the end, they all have the ability to just bend, be shaped, flatten, and they don't just shatter apart like salts, ionic substances do. Okay, so there we go. So add that for metals. Um, we'll come back to melting here. Okay, solubility, good. Metals are never soluble. They can rust in water and then eventually go away, but that's something totally different than just dissolving. All right, so metals will never dissolve in water. Okay, but they do always conduct as solids. Um, hence why we use them for conduction. Um, but metals will always conduct as solids. And then we did come to the main conclusion here that, yeah, metals typically have high melting points. It takes a lot of heat to melt them. Now, once again, there's exceptions to this. We're trying to keep a general trend for when you do your unknown, so I won't give you any weird ones. But there are some metals that melt actually quite easily. Um, gallium, for example, will melt in your hand. Um, it has such a low melting point, you can hold it and it will just, that brick of metal will melt in your hand. Um, there's actually a book one time I was reading about scientists back in the early 1900s and they play tricks on their friends and they make spoons out of gallium and then like give it to their friend to like stir their tea with. And so like as they're stirring their tea, the spoon just like dissolved away. The book's called The Disappearing Spoon. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of cool metal. So um, questions on any of our properties? So. Before you do our next activity, just once again, I keep repeating this because I want you to see the end in mind. Your quiz for this unit, which is happening in two times, we only have one more day that we'll go over some things and practice stuff. It's a small unit, and then we'll take our quiz. On quiz day, there's going to be two parts. One part will be on a computer, similar to what you've seen before, probably like give you a chemical symbol. Is this ionic covalent or metallic? Give you a model. Is this ionic covalent or metallic? But the final part is you're going to come into the lab on your own, so you won't get to work with the lab group, you have to do it by yourself, I'm gonna give you three cups. The difference this time is you will not know the substance in the cups. On the lab, I told you, oh, it's aluminum, oh, it's zinc. So now you're gonna have to go in reverse, perform whatever test you feel necessary, and tell me cup number one is metallic because of this. Cup number two is whatever you think they are. Does that make sense? Kind of just go in in reverse of what will come. Yeah, is each cup going to be like one of these or anything? No, so it could be, you could have two in one, you could have, actually I think we changed it, I think you're only testing two things now. We used to do three, but I don't know, either way, if it was three, it still could be any combination. So yeah, yeah, don't by default just assume that it must be something because of it. Yeah, good question. Any other questions on that? All right, the last thing we're going to get into today, and it will roll into next time as well, is understanding the why of these properties. Why are ionics never malleable? Relating it down to the molecular level. 
Okay, so here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna come around to each table and I'm gonna give you a bag, okay? In the bag is going to be a little card that is gonna tell you the property you're gonna focus on and which type of bond. So this particular one is for covalence and you're addressing the category of melting point. So the end goal is you're gonna to try to come up with an explanation of why do covalents have low melting points in connecting it to the molecular level. Okay, at the end, you're gonna have about 10 minutes. You are then gonna come up with a, your group and you're gonna teach the rest of the class. And that's how we'll finish it, fill in that next column right there, okay? Now, in your bag as well are some model pieces to help you in your explanation and to help you figure it out. Okay, the models are all different depending on what property you're testing, so I'll kind of give more explanation depending on the bag. Okay, um, but here's kind of the thought process, and this is on the card that I want you to think through. Okay, so the first checkbox here says use your model to understand what the type of bond looks like at the molecular level. So some of you will be given pieces like this because you'll be looking at an ionic, and so on your table I would build an ionic structure, right? So you know, okay, this is what it looks like before I perform any test to it, okay? Second bullet point says, think about what happens at the molecular level when that property happens. What can help you with this is a section of your notes, if you wanna flip there, where we talked about each of the properties before we went into the lab, going back here, this one. Okay, where we talked about in order for something to be soluble, what's happening at the molecular level? In order for something to connect electricity, what's happening at the molecular level? Okay, so then your next step is, okay, here's my model. What about this model and this would make that property true? Okay, once again, the goal is to come up with an explanation of why that happens. Why do ionics, why are they never malleable? Why are covalents sometimes not go, right? Depending on which card you have, okay? Now, I would encourage you with your explanation you come up with to go what I would call three whys deep, okay? So be like a two-year-old here where they just keep asking why, okay? So once you come up with your explanation, ask why to it, make it better. Then ask why again, then ask why again, and then you probably hit it on the head at that point. Because <laughs> normally your first one isn't gonna be deep enough yet. Okay, I'm here to help. I'm not gonna give you the answers, but I'll help you think through it if you're stuck. Um, in the end, what I want you to do, I want you to write your final conclusion, and it says somewhat of your claim evidence reasoning on your boogie board as a group, and then you'll bring that up to the front to show the class. Okay, when you come teach everybody, you need to either tell them what they're gonna draw in that box, so there's a box we're gonna fill in our notes. So you're gonna tell them either to draw a picture, you think the picture represents it well, or you're going to tell them what to write to explain it, okay? All right, once I get all the bags out, I'll give you about, you got about 12 minutes to figure it out before we'll teach each other, okay? All right, any questions? and why they have high melting points. You guys get... Let's do this. 
you guys get ionic solubility? So why ionic is always soluble? So you have in your bag, so this represents your ionic, so positive and negative, positive and negative. And then these are water molecules. So you can kind of play around with both of those to see why ionic solubility. Yeah. All right, you guys are going to get ionic and why this is going to be solids. And you guys are going to get ionic and why All right, ready, set, go. Okay. Start, look at your check boxes on the card. That can help you know where to go, okay? There's three check boxes. So just go through those. So, wait, what is the water bottle? So once again, look at the three check marks. Start by building the model that you have. Is melting molecule slice. Do they connect? So. To, so when something goes from a solid to a liquid, I'll say this now, something must be moving apart from each other. That's the only difference between a liquid and a solid is like solids are close and locked together, liquids are apart and But it can be both. Sometimes it's just the atoms, sometimes it's the molecules. Does that help? Get you started? Okay.
Oh, I didn't stop this. Sorry, people at home. 